Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael Lofton. Saturday night. Doing a show here on the Nephilim. <laughs> Which is probably something y'all would not have expected uh, to be on Reason in Theology. But, hey, you know what? Uh, we do pretty much a little bit of everything so here here you go uh the nephilim you know this is actually something that i've, I've been wanting to do for quite a long time in fact i mentioned before that i'm, I'm willing to do even a, a debate on this issue even though i'll admit this is not an essential doctrine for christianity or something like that so if you disagree with what i say it's fine this is a matter of uh, theological opinion, <clears throat> but I, I think it's still fun to go over. So what we're going to do is go over a few scriptures and some early resources, uh, ancient resources on who the Nephilim were, give you my opinion, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the other views. Again, perfectly fine to disagree. <clears throat> well, when it comes to the Nephilim, this is a term that we find in the Old Testament. And I'm going to give just a basic overview today. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details. <laughs> uh, although, believe it or not, a lot of details could be uh, explored when it comes here uh, to this topic. The Nephilim is something that we first see in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 4. We see them mentioned elsewhere later on after the flood uh, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. The Nephilim, uh, it's not defined in Scripture per se. So that's part of the problem. That's one of the reasons why there's somewhat of a debate here, because... Scripture doesn't give us a definition of who the Nephilim were beyond a short description. And some people have tried to get into the etymology of what Nephal means um, in Hebrew. And you know, we, we can do that another time. All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Let me read it. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days <clears throat> and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old men of renown. Doesn't give you any more than that. <laughs> that that's it. It's the description Genesis gives us. Some have connected and actually made connections between these men of renown, heroes of old with the Titans in Greek mythology. <clears throat> in fact, when you look at mythology, um, all kinds of mythologies out there have some notion of giants on the earth, fallen angels, um, mating with humans. There, there's generally a, a tradition there. So there might be a grain of truth to it. Could be what Genesis 6-4 is talking about here. Notice this is happening right before the flood. Very important because we're going to look at some New Testament texts that will interpret Genesis 6 for us, which is I, I think is very important because <clears throat> I argue that the New Testament writers interpret Genesis sufficiently enough for us to conclude that these were fallen angels who um, were with uh, women, human women, and produced giants on the earth. One of the the objections to that is that, well, okay, that might be one of the reasons why, <coughs> excuse me, God um, flooded the earth because the vast majority of people per perhaps had already been infected with this, if you will, and Noah and his family uh, were still pure, were righteous in God's eyes. Uh, so some would speculate that, you know, God was was getting rid of this. But then you have after the flood, you have them coming up again. And we also see references to Og, king of Bashan, and, and others who are clearly giants. And, of course, you know, David and Goliath, right? So, I mean, the response, the general response is, well, what happened prior to the flood just simply happened afterwards again. They did it again. 
one of the responses to that is going to be, well, the New Testament, Jesus talks about how, um, you know, in heaven, they're neither uh, given in marriage. They're, they're not given in marriage like they are on earth. Um, in other words, they don't, uh, you know, angels, they don't, they don't propagate in heaven. Uh, yeah, sure. That's their ordinary state. It, ordinarily, angels don't propagate. They, they, they're immaterial. Um, absolutely. But that doesn't address the issue of could an angel take on uh, material form and um, have children with humans. Jesus doesn't address that. Uh, and what he says doesn't exclude that view. Okay. So <clears throat> again, Genesis 6, 4, it's talking about the flood right before the flood. There are the Nephilim on the earth in those days. And also afterward is what it says. When the sons of God, hmm, interesting term. Generally, the term sons of God applies to angels in the Old Testament. Adam is called the son of God, sure, but in a very different way than the angels, right? Um, here, we have no reason to believe that the term sons of God is being used in the same way that it's used of Adam. Elsewhere, however, when the same term is used, it, it's always in reference to angels. So we have no reason to interpret here the term sons of God as anything other than angels. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old men of renown. Is it talking about, uh, you know, giants here? Or is it just talking about people who were just uh, heroes? A, a little ambiguous. Uh, again, what you do have is the Jewish tradition of the Old Testament and its meaning here, which was that these were fallen angels. Uh, giving birth to or creating, if you will, through through human women, um, giants. There was another interpretation given after the Jews. So even after uh, the Old Testament Jews and <clears throat> even after the first century Christians, which would have continued the Jewish interpretation. Um, and this new interpretation was given by St. Augustine <clears throat> in his work on, on the city of God. And he's really the first to introduce a different interpretation other than it being fallen angels. And he comes up with the idea that the sons of Seth propagated with the uh, daughters of Cain. And they produced um, not giants, but the the race that they produced, if you will. I mean, they're, they're still humans, but I guess the uh, the genealogy is polluted because you shouldn't have the sons of Seth mixing with the daughters of Cain because Cain was cursed. And so uh, here you have, if you will, the covenant community mixing with people who are not part of the covenant community. And so that, that's just wrong. And so nothing nothing mystical is going on here. And no giants are being created. It's just that what what's the problem is the covenant community is, is mixing with people who are not part of the covenant community. And this is forbidden. Okay, so there's that interpretation, but again, I, I don't think it has the best biblical support, and it definitely doesn't have the consensus that we would have found prior to Augustine, and so not only the early Christian consensus, but um, also how, how did the Jews understand this when they were given the scriptures? Not that that's always you know, going to give you, <clears throat> in all cases, uh, the right interpretation, because clearly the Jews at the time of the uh, New Testament, the mass, vast majority of them were wrong on the interpretation of who the Messiah was, right? So, I mean, I'm not saying that as if that is going to be a, a silver bullet, but I am just saying it should be taken into account when you do have a consensus there uh, with, with the Jews. And this is, of course, expressed by Josephus. Josephus notes, <clears throat> let me quote him, says, from his antiquity of the Jews, uh, he says, for many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence that they had in their own strength. And the, and the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those 
uh, whom the Grecians called giants. So he's making a, a connection there with uh, the Titans. But Noah was very uneasy a, as to uh, at what they did and being displeased at their conduct persuaded them to change their disposition and their acts for the better. But seeing they did not yield to him, but were slaves to their wicked pleasures, he was afraid they would kill him uh, together with his wife and children and those that had married. So he departed out of that land and so on and so forth. So Josephus is just getting us the understanding of of um, Genesis 6 4 um, by the Jewish people, by the Old Covenant community. Okay. Well, let's move on to a couple New Testament texts that will interpret Genesis 6 4 for us. And then we're going to look at the book of Enoch to give a good first century um, understanding and interpretation of not that Josephus isn't first century, he is, but it, let's, let's give another source that will go over the first century reception of what's going on here in Genesis 6 and who the Nephilim are. So one interesting text is from Jude that talks about this. Why is Jude important? As I'm going to show you, it quotes from First Enoch. And First Enoch is all about fallen angels mixing with humans and creating giants. I mean, it's very explicit. It quotes from first Enoch and also says this though you already know this I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt but later destroyed those who did not believe okay so he's talking about destroying unbelievers and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority some translates uh, some translations put it their first estate their first abode but abandon their proper dwelling. Hmm? Angels leaving their dwelling? What is this talking about? Didn't keep their positions of authority, abandoned their proper dwelling. These he's ha he has kept in darkness. Now you, you could say, okay, maybe this is just, you know, when, when the angels fell and rebelled against God. Well, I mean, it, it's definitely related to that. Either way you look at this, it's, it's definitely related to that. Uh, whichever side you, you land on here. <clears throat> bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. But notice what he says next. He's talking about the fallen angels leaving their proper dwelling. Yes, I uh, see you, Mr. Sir Dude, talking about in the chat, their proper dwelling with God. Sure, we, we can under, understand it that way. But notice what he says next. Here's the kicker. In a similar way, so he's making a comparison with what happened with the fallen angels rebelling against God. In what way they rebelled, doesn't specifically say, rebelling against God. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example for those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Think of that for a moment. What was the problem with Sodom and Gomorrah? It, it was sexual, wasn't it? <laughs> going after strange flesh did they not yes in a similar way as the angels mm. so sodom and gomorrah engaged in gross sexual sin in a similar way that the fallen angels did what what do you think that's referring to Sounds a lot like Genesis 6 4, if we understand this as fallen angels. But that's not all. There's something else. And by the way, again, this is the same book that's quoting from First Enoch that takes that interpretation. <laughs> so Jude knew that First Enoch took this position, right? <laughs> now, no, notice what's next. 1 Peter 3, this is, let's start with, uh, let's see what uh, verse to start with. Let's just start with 18. Um, yeah. 
For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. It was only a few people, eight in all, who were saved in this water uh, symbolizes baptism now that I'm sorry, baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, now, but notice what he says here. Imprisoned spirits who were disobedient long ago in the days of Noah when the ark was being built. What is he talking about here? Disobedient or imprisoned spirits. He's connecting these spirits that are imprisoned, perhaps human spirits, angelic spirits, doesn't really state, but he makes a connection in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Very, very interesting reference. There is definitely a way to understand that as perhaps fallen angels. Now, let me see if I can get uh, another one here. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Get which uh, text here. Let me go to Second Peter. Uh, sorry, I thought I, had, uh, thought I had it pulled up. But uh, let me pull it up now. Second Peter 2, 4. This says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, perhaps that's, that's what he was talking about in First uh, Peter 3. Those could be understood as human spirits, though. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah. Okay, so notice he's talking about angels sinning and connecting it with the days of Noah in the flood. What was going on with the days of Noah in the flood? We just read Genesis 6-4, the sons of God. And here he's talking about angels? <clears throat> There are ways to interpret all of these texts in a way that's consistent with Augustine's view and say that this has nothing to do with fallen angels. There's a way to interpret all these texts that way. But what's the most natural way from what we're seeing here, the themes that we're seeing? <clears throat> but protect and Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wait, 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 what? What? We're back to Sodom and Gomorrah again, sexual sins. Why is he talking about the flood, fallen angels, and sexual sins again? Are you noticing some themes here? <laughs> uh, by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by depraved conduct of the lawless. What was wrong with Lot again? Sexual sin. Y'all remember that story? <laughs> go go read Genesis if you don't remember that story. Yeah. Um, needless to say, there were, there were some issues going on there. <clears throat> For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord saw, knows how to rescue the godly from trials and, and to hold the unrighteous. <clears throat> for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Again, notice the themes. Notice the connections. The most natural reading for all of these texts when you put them together is that there were fallen angels who were um, guilty of sexual sins with women, creating giants and the in the days of Noah. And this is compared to Sodom and Gomorrah, who also engaged in sexual sins. That was their problem. Lastly, 
as I noted, Jude is quoting from uh, First Enoch. How would the natural reader in the first century, when they read Jude and what Jude was saying there about the days of Noah and these these angels and all that who are rebelling against God, <clears throat> how would the average first century reader understand that text that is quoting from first Enoch. <laughs> they would understand it as fallen angels because here's what first Enoch says. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters and the angels, the children of heaven, children of heaven, sons of God, anybody, Saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children, and so on and so on and so on. Much more going on there. That is how the average person would have read Jude, who's quoting from First Enoch, who explicitly tells us that these angels in the days of Noah in Genesis 6. <clears throat> Had giants with with women. That's how they would have understood Jude in the New Testament. Is it just definitive? Is it just absolutely the most necessary reading? No. Again, you can divorce scripture from the tradition in which it was written and the the context in which it was written and the way that the first century community <clears throat> would have understood it. Yeah, you can divorce it from that um, that tradition. Sure. Of course, and you can read it in a way that would support Augustine's interpretation. But I don't think that's the most natural reading. And I think the vast majority of support goes to the fallen angel theory. So that's my quick take on who the Nephilim were. I hope that was helpful to y'all. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Make sure to put them to at reason and theology, and I will answer them. Otherwise... We'll kill the stream here in just a minute. Let me scroll through the chat, see if I see any questions already. Uh, see y'all asking about Jonathan. He's actually going to be on the show, so maybe we can do that. Uh, let me look and see if there's any anything else. So could fallen angels incarnate materially <clears throat> incarnate? materially and have children sorry i'm still getting over a cold here as y'all can tell could fallen angels incarnate materially and have children sure seems that way not naturally you know naturally a, a spirit couldn't do that right a spirit's immaterial so naturally they couldn't do that could god allow them to do that yeah in the same way that naturally a disembodied human spirit you're going to rub run up against all kinds of epistemological problems but that doesn't mean we can't still learn some things whenever our our spirit is separated from body because there are some ways in which god could <clears throat> infuse knowledge directly into us and so on so god can make some kind of exceptions and provisions there in that same way, I mean, could he not allow this to take place for fallen angels for a greater purpose? Yes, he could. Of course he could. <clears throat> but it wouldn't be something that they would naturally do because a fallen angel naturally doesn't have a body. This would be something unnatural. Just like what was going on with Sodom and Gomorrah was unnatural. You see the connection there? <clears throat> That uh, he's he's bringing out just in the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah tried to do something unnatural sexually. The fallen angels were doing something unnatural sexually. Uh, see if there's anything else. Uh, yeah. Do you think that some of the technological developments were aided by demons? That's been one of those theories out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> the aliens are are fallen angels. They're Nephilim and responsible for <clears throat> technological progress in the last century. It's it's interesting stuff, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's it's hard for me to say 
yes because it's it's pretty not not only is it pretty fanciful stuff but it's also uh really hard to substantiate you know i, I like going more with what what is the most reasonable conclusion <clears throat> Now I, I'm not excluding it. I'm not. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying I'm more inclined to believe that it is part of natural progress, uh, not necessarily by fallen angels or uh, extraterrestrials. Hey, I'm willing to stand corrected if that's not the case. Okay, but I'm just saying. I don't know if I see it. What's that uh, show? I, I like watching it on occasion. It's 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 really into this stuff. Um, gosh, what is it called? Ancient Aliens. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's fascinating. A fascinating show. I don't take it seriously. <laughs> the the Ancient Aliens show. I don't. Uh, ancient Astronaut Theory. <laughs> I don't take it seriously. But it is extremely entertaining stuff, and they tie in all of this together, so it's it's good entertainment. Uh, I'm not knocking you if you think that there's some truth to it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's hard for me to take that leap of faith. Uh, let's see. Perhaps the ruin reconstruction theory should be taken a little bit more seriously. This may be a key to understanding the Nephilim. Uh, you know, offhand, I'm <clears throat> not familiar with the term or the concept ruin reconstruction theory. I, I don't know what that is. Maybe if you explained it, I would say, oh, okay, I've heard this or something. But offhand, I don't know. Uh, let's see. I'm looking. Uh, what else do we have in the chat, y'all? I'm looking. <laughs> aliens land in michael's yard next day take us to your leader <laughs> uh you never know maybe they're watching this stream and they're not happy that that i didn't give them credit for the technological progress so they're gonna come and do something <laughs> fun stuff um yeah guest uh jimmy aiken talks about aliens and i think that's fun uh, in fact i need to go back and um <clears throat> watch i was watching one of his mysterious world uh podcasts it, it, it's really good I, I enjoyed it not knocking it uh yeah somebody's saying you you'd like jimmy aiken's mysterious world if you like ancient aliens i i i do i i really i liked ancient aliens although i will say there was one episode that i saw where they were actually trying to argue that lucifer was actually right to argue that man should eat from the forbidden fruit and it's like y'all are literally lawyering <laughs> trying to argue in favor of satan in the fall the rebellion i mean it, really <laughs> They were explicit about it too. So clearly, this is not written, uh, and this is not scripted by believers or anything. <laughs> so, the, yeah, the ancient uh, astronaut theorists are definitely not Christians. They, they would have a different understanding of, of the Bible. Although, I've tried to get some of those guys on. Y'all remember the guy who, who, who does the, the meme? Uh, I'm not saying it's aliens, but aliens. <laughs> Y'all remember that meme? Somebody tell me y'all know that. He's one of the guys <clears throat> from Ancient Aliens. I forget his name, but he's used in all kinds of memes. And I tried to get him on, uh, but I got no response. <laughs> Maybe it's that he couldn't take me seriously to come on my show. <laughs> the guy <laughs> that nobody takes seriously couldn't take me seriously to come on my show. But yeah. <laughs> That would have been a fun show, by the way. Yeah, the guy with the huge hair. Yeah, he has this huge hair, and he's, he looks like he's really high. And he's like, I'm not saying it's aliens, bro, but aliens. <laughs> yeah, uh, Georges uh, Tsukalos, I guess. Yeah, he's he's on Ancient Aliens all the time. Um, really, really entertaining. I bet he and I would have had the, the best conversation ever. <laughs> That would have been the best show ever if he would just come on. We don't have to agree with each other. I I don't I'm not gonna agree with him, 
but we could have a really fun time disagree. <laughs> it would be awesome. <clears throat> so maybe if one of y'all knows them, try to get them to come on the show. I mean, again, uh, I, I don't know why he wouldn't uh, take me seriously enough to come on. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> yeah, anyways, uh, let me look through and see if I find anything else. Oh, gap theory. Yeah, many people confuse it with advocating evolution. You talk about gap theory there in Genesis 1, where people try to uh, insert this long gap there between a couple of the verses there. Yeah, uh, problem with that is, you know, who, who actually held to that interpretation <laughs> um, historically? Or the the view that there's this pre-Adamic race, you know, in that gap, alleged gap there in Genesis one. <clears throat> yeah, again, who 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 maintained this in, in in Judaism, in the Old Testament, or in Christianity and the New Covenant? I mean, who who actually believes that? So uh, that's part of my problem. Is is it just has absolutely no uh, traditional backing? Mm, I'm looking. Would I have Martin Navarro on to talk about the liturgical changes? I'd be interested in it. Shoot me an email. Let's see if you can get us uh, if you can get us to talk and get us in touch. Uh, we could maybe do that. Uh, so start an email chain. Uh, why is the Book of Enoch in, not in the Bible? <clears throat> what well, is for the Ethiopians, right? Ethiopian Orthodox, but it's it's not for the rest of us. Um, why is it not in the Bible? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. It was <clears throat> it was never received as scripture in uh, either the Old Testament uh, era or the New Covenant. It was never received as scripture, so that would be why it's not in the canon. The people of God never received it as scripture. Um, the vast majority of them, right? Again, you point to the 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 Ethiopians, but again, substantially, the the church never received in them that doesn't mean that it doesn't have some kind of interpretive authority it might not be inspired although the the part that enoch quotes is inspired by virtue of the fact that i'm sorry jude quotes it's inspired not because enoch wrote it but because it's it's on it was confirmed under the inspiration of scripture that that prophecy that non uh inspired though from god prophecy because not all prophecies are inspired in what we refer to as scripture. Um, by the fact that Jude confirmed it under the inspiration, of, it becomes inspired. That doesn't mean that everything else in First Enoch is inspired, though it may have interpretive authority for understanding what's going on by what Jude is quoting. You see what I'm saying? So <clears throat> I think that is important to note. I'm looking. Uh, do the Ethiopian Eastern Catholics have Enoch in their canon? Not to my recollection. If you come across somebody who says otherwise, please let me know. I'm looking. Have I ever considered have conf confessionally reformed Christians on your channel? Yes, I have. We have had them in the past, and I would be interested in it in the future. But check out our video history. We've done that. Uh, in fact, I was supposed to get Horton on, Michael Horton. That was a while back. I, was, I, need to, I forgot all about that. I need to uh, follow up with them, um, see if we can <clears throat> get them back on. Uh, what else do we have in the chat? I'm looking. Anything else? Do guns work on aliens or should I get a laser gun? If you get a laser gun, let me know. <laughs> Just say it. Let, let me know. Uh, do you think if we encounter aliens, we should talk to them? That's a good question, because if these extraterrestrials are demons, should we talk to demons? No. Now, one of the rules that an, any exorcist will tell you is that you do not communicate with a demon that's oppressing you, or you do not have direct communication with it. 
Priests under the authority of their bishop are able to have certain limited communication. For that reason, they're under the authority of the bishop and it's limited. You, however, if you don't have that authority, you're not a priest. You don't have that um, authority from a bishop. You're not to have any communication with them because it just simply gives them more of a right to continue to interact further in your life. <clears throat> so you you don't interact with them. But then you asked about aliens, not demons, right? But if the extraterrestrials are really demons, then you wouldn't. If they're just extraterrestrials, if there is such a thing, and they're not demons posing as some kind of extraterrestrial, should we talk to them? Uh, I think that we should, but how do you establish all of that? I don't know. So, <laughs> How do you know it's not the diva just deceiving you, <laughs> making you think it's not a diva? It's just an extraterrestrial so that they can uh, communicate with you further. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, between a rock and a hard place there. <clears throat> I'm looking here. What else do we have? Uh, <laughs> uh have you seen an exorcist before? I've I've talked to um, a few exorcists. I mean, Father Ripperger is an exorcist. Um, who's the other exorcist that I had on? I mean, I'm, uh, I picture his face, but I'm I don't recall his name off the top of my head. Help me out here in the chat. Y'all remember we had him on about maybe a year ago. He was on Paranormal Witness. You know that that TV show Paranormal Witness. Uh, what was his his name? He's he's been making his rounds in the Catholic um, Catholic channels, um, but I, I'm drawing a blank on his name, and I apologize to him because I mean he's he's an awesome guy. I I know his face, I know about him, but I can't not think of his name. Yeah, Vince uh, Lampert. Yeah, Father Lampert. I apologize. I don't know why I'm blanking on his name there, but. Yeah, I talked to him. I've read all of Father Amort's uh, material. <clears throat> all of the stuff <clears throat> on uh, demonic possession. Many, many, many books on uh, demons and demonology and exorcisms and Alakai and Martin's works on it. Um, all kinds of stuff. Read, read a lot on it. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, I, I have. <clears throat> All right, let me look further, see what else. Um, what else do we have in the chat? Uh, okay, is Yahweh the angel of great counsel? Deuteronomy <clears throat> 32, 8. Go to it. 32, 8. The Most High gave the nations their inheritance when he divided all mankind. He set up boundaries for people according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. What am, what am I missing here? Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 8. Mm. Not seeing it. Maybe that's uh, the wrong citation there. Um, but, of course, Jesus is going to <clears throat> not be any kind of created angel, right? It would be in, in, improper to really, <clears throat> at at this point, talk about him as an angel because it's going to be confused with created angels, although we could talk about him as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, uh, as long as we understand that's an uncreated being. Um, <clears throat> as long as we make the proper qualifications, I'm, I'm okay with us using that term, but most aren't going to use the proper qualifications that they just hear that they think that oh you're you're a Jehovah's Witness or something, you're identifying Jesus as Michael the Archangel or or a created being. Uh, let's see. Regarding yesterday's video and tradition, Scott Hahn pointed out today on Matt Fred's stream that the can is extra biblical tradition <clears throat> thoughts. Yeah, I I actually intended to do a whole show on this. Somebody brought this up yesterday. Let me give you a quick answer, and then we'll <clears throat> we'll we'll do a whole show on it. It'll probably be in my next show tomorrow. So, 
I would say the canon is a secondary object of infallibility. Secondary objects of infallibility are not primary objects. They do not have to be implicit or explicit in tr tradition or scripture, the deposit of faith itself. They could be something that is necessary historically or logically in order to maintain something that is in the deposit of faith, <clears throat> scripture and tradition. So. I would say it's a secondary object of infallibility by way of a historical, something that has to be maintained historically uh, and necessarily true in that sense in order to maintain the deposit of faith itself. Uh, so that's the quick, quick answer. And let me give an example. Um, if we were to say Nicaea 1 infallibly and definitively defined <clears throat> that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, you might come back and say, well, how do you know Nicaea 1 is an ecumenical council that has the authority to definitively uh, define that? And, and we would say, okay, that is a secondary object of infallibility, which can be defined by the magisterium. We could define Nicaea 1 as an ecumenical council in order to uphold the, its definition, right? Uh, but was it ever revealed in scripture and tradition that Nicaea 1 is an ecumenical council? No. So it's not a primary object of infallibility, but we, the magisterium could definitively declare that Nicaea 1 is an ecumenical council as a secondary object of infallibility because it's historically necessary to uphold something that is a primary object of infallibility, namely that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father. That's the quick answer. I'm going to try to unpack that a little bit more in a future show. Um, the channel is way undersubbed. I agree with you, Charlie, but then again, I'm biased, right? <laughs> be show, it'd be fun if Michael did a show about politics. Maybe, I don't know. You, you might laugh at me the whole time because, um, I mean, I, I know an average amount about politics, but it, it's, uh, it's not something that I could comment on as well as I can theology, history, and philosophy. So I don't know. You might be bored. <clears throat> so let's see what else we have. Uh, how far can one accept Enoch as factual or historical? Yeah, I mean, this is, look, there's not enough to bind your conscience, right? I mean, I, I couldn't say your conscience is bound to accept anything other than what Jude quotes from. I can't say your conscience is bound to accept anything else from Jude. I, I can't say that. So I would say the only way that you could argue somebody would would still um, accept something in First Enoch would be by way of reason, by way of reason and non uh, non divine apostolic traditions. So perhaps ecclesiastical traditions or something like that. So I can't bind your conscience and say you just got to accept this, right? But I, I think that there is some interpretive authority there. But again, that, that's not enough to just bind your conscience and say you got to believe me on this. No, uh, that's why I'm uh, okay to say we can agree to disagree if you don't agree with my interpretation here. Uh, fair answer, I guess I misunderstood your point of revelation being at least implicit in the Bible. Well, what I'm referring to is primary objects of infallibility being at least implicit. That's what I'm referring to. I'm not saying everything that's definitive is materially in Scripture. I'm not saying that. I'm saying everything that's defined as a primary object of infallibility is in Scripture and tradition, at least implicitly. Right. So <clears throat> I am saying that. Good point. Great question. It, it needed to be asked, which is why I'm going to do a whole show on it. So I'll look uh, forward to that. Have I had Ryan Grant on? Yeah, uh, Ryan Grant on. Yes, twice. <clears throat> uh, what else? RT is way underrated. Again, I agree, but I'm biased. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I got a cough and clear my throat. <laughs> Still trying to get over, over this. I've had it for a few days here. So if y'all can't tell, I'm sick right now. So might have a little bit of a fever. I can feel it in my head too. <clears throat> well, why doesn't God destroy immoral cities in the present way, the way he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? 
He could, right? But I think he has a purpose uh, in not doing so. What is that purpose? I can only offer speculation. I don't know. Uh, could be that in the Old Testament he was he he did that to Sodom and Gomorrah to demonstrate his justice, whereas now he is uh, demonstrating his overabundance of mercy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> speculation on my part I, I couldn't authoritatively say for sure um what else yeah how many righteous people are there in modern cities <laughs> well everyone's who bapt who's baptized is righteous right <laughs> at least when they're baptized maybe maybe not for very long afterwards uh <laughs> Somebody said, uh, quick, Michael smells something, prove it's not COVID, right? <laughs> it's definitely not. It's definitely not. <clears throat> it's just a regular cold. Uh, I'm looking. What else do we have? If there's nothing else. I'll kill the stream. Yeah. I think that's it. Uh, somebody says Michael Heiser's done a lot of work on the Nephilim. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Um, have I heard of Catholic presenter schism 206? Never in my life. Is that a person? Is that a channel? I don't know what that is. Um, it looks like computer program language. <laughs> Catholic presenter schism 206. Co uh, semicolon uh parentheses I, I guess that's supposed to be a, a a down i don't know if that's supposed to be an emoji or I, I don't know i don't know what that is uh i'm looking uh did i say that dr Cooper is going to be de debating jimmy again yeah i saw that i saw that uh, <clears throat> he was supposed to debate me on uh, Gospel Simplicity's channel, but we never got a response. So I just said, you know what? I'm not interested in debating him anymore because <laughs> it was like three weeks we were waiting on a response from him. And I need to know, do I, do I prepare for this debate or not? Uh, <laughs> couldn't get a response. So I just emailed Gospel Simplicity and said, scratch him. I I'm not interested. Even if he accepts at this point, I'm not interested. Um, just give me somebody else. Um, <clears throat> so he got me somebody else. So we'll we'll do that on the fourth. Uh, what else? Uh, so schism two hundred six, aka Michael Joseph. Okay, he he was uh, on Timothy Flanner's show recently. No, I, I'm I'm not familiar with him. Uh, if he's good, let, let me know. Have not seen that. Uh, is that your Chris date debate? Correct which I have not prepared for at all yet, so I need to get on it. Uh, I have, what, a week? <laughs> not even a week. I have one, two, three, four, five days. Well, <sighs> I need to go ahead and prepare for that and uh, get it knocked out of the way so I could get back to... Um, some of my other studies although it, it it is helpful to to go over and incidentally I, I guess i've done a little preparation just because of other other things that i'm studying on scripture and tradition helps with this debate but i haven't specifically um prepared for the proposition that um there is an authority outside of scripture that is infallible right i haven't specifically prepared for that <clears throat> Uh, which is is what effectively I'm going to argue for. Uh, so I need to do that. Uh, not only not prepared, but not promoted. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it, it, and by the way, no, it's not going to be on my channel. It's going to be on... Uh, did I say gospel simplicity? I'm sorry. I, I don't, it's not gospel simplicity. Um it's um gosh why am i drawing a blank here uh the gospel truth channel i apologize um no, it's it's not on gospel simplicity it's on gospel truth 
um, which which he he seems to have some really cool debates uh, from from what I've seen. So I, I think he mostly just does host debates. Really good stuff from what I've seen. So I mean, hey, go check his channel out. Um, definitely worth seeing. Oh, I see you there. Gospel simplicity. Literally just got on. The first thing I hear is not gospel. Yeah, because I think I was confusing your channel. The debate I'm going to be doing. I think I had said gospel simplicity, but I was thinking gospel truth. I'm going to be doing the debate on gospel truths channel. Good channel. Go check it out. Uh, not on gospel simplicity. And I think I had originally said I, I was doing it on there. So I didn't want anybody to uh, misunderstand. It's not on gospel simplicity. Uh, but check out gospel simplicity too. <laughs> really good stuff there too. So I'm not saying don't go and check them out. I just didn't want anybody to think that, oh, you know, <clears throat> I'm doing a debate on there and then be disappointed <laughs> when they see it's not on there. So uh, both good channels, good stuff uh, from everything that that I've seen. So um <clears throat> yeah anyways i'm looking to see if there's anything else did y'all have any other questions or uh do you know firsthand sources <clears throat> of the jehovah's witnesses that show they believe jesus is michael the archangel firsthand sources no and it has been so long since i've studied jehovah's witnesses i have heard some people dispute that by the way so Glad you brought that up. <clears throat> not in a very long time. I'm not prepared to give any offhand. I would have to do so uh, perhaps after after the stream. Uh, let's see. Nice use of the green screen. Couldn't even tell in the other video. Your your view was small. Yeah, you can tell a little bit here, right? <laughs> Although I, would, I, I intend to build a setup like this anyway, so eventually we'll get there uh in the meantime we'll we'll use a green screen on occasion and then we'll just use my regular background on occasion <clears throat> thought i would just switch it up a little bit um and so it's on their website they say that christ and michael the archangel are the same <clears throat> could be yeah i'll have to take your word for it offhand um primary source i haven't been able to verify that it's on their their website though so i apologize uh will i have e michael jones back on <clears throat> i don't know i don't know you know it's it's he's a wild card you know uh i hesitated to have him on the first time i mean i only had him on because i had dr michael brown on and everybody felt like well in order to be fair in order to be balanced have him on and so I had him on. So uh, you might say that's not the best idea. I understand. You might say it was a great idea. I understand. Uh, no, it's not that I, I'm, I'm afraid of getting banned. That, that's not why. I, I, I don't care uh, ultimately about that. Um, it's more of would that give the best message or signal i guess is is so i prudentially question it i guess uh what else do we have is there anything else otherwise i'm gonna end it did charles taze russell agree with all contemporary doctrines of the jehovah's witnesses no he did not <laughs> Uh, show me where Charles Taze Russell was was again celebrating Christmas. I'd like to see that one because I know the Jehovah's Witnesses were doing that well after the time of Charles Taze Russell. So I, I would think that there were some differences there. Uh, but that's partly speculation on my, my part. So correct me if I'm wrong. All right. I think that is it. So we'll go ahead and end it there. I hope this was helpful as far as Nephilim. I'm willing to do even a debate on it. So if somebody that you know wants to do a friendly intramural Christian debate on who are the Nephilim, maybe we could do that. It'll probably just have to be off the cuff for me. I don't have time to prepare a whole lot for that one. So it'll just 
it'll have to be kind of impromptu. Uh, but maybe send me some names if you know some people who want to <clears throat> maintain the Augustinian view and I'll maintain the more traditional view. Um, and again, I hope this was helpful. If y'all liked it and want to see more on it, just let me know in the chat. And that way I know we need to do more ancient alien stuff. <laughs> again, um, hard for me to take some of that stuff seriously but really really entertaining um and if y'all can get that other guy the gorgeous guy what was his name gorgias or whatever it was if y'all can get him to come on the show for me maybe email him or something see if he'll come on that would be epic or really fun i think uh we, we would all have a really good time so see if y'all can maybe reach out to him and get him to come on all right, well, that'll do it. Until next time, God bless you all.